Uh, welcome everyone to the Maryland Business Rebooted webinar. The Maryland Rebooted program was created by the Smith School of Business uh, faculty members at the University of Maryland, Michelle Little and Judy Frells, to really help Maryland business owners navigate the impact of COVID-19. Today, our lecture will be given by Smith School's marketing professor, Ji Chang. Ji is professor of marketing and the Harvey Sanders uh, Sanders Fellow of Retail Management at the Smith School, and from her title, you can already tell that she's an expert of retail management. She will be um, giving a three-part series on retail management for the program, and today is her first lecture of this three-part series. And I'm sure we're all very excited to hear from her today, as I am, I am too. My name is Nicole Kim, and I'm a coordinator for the program. And in today's lecture, I'll help deliver questions that you may have um, to G. So, so please submit any of your questions that you might have throughout the webinar through either the Q&A section or the chat function. And now, without further ado, I'll hand over the floor to G. Thank you, Nicole. And thanks to everybody for joining me and my colleagues here at the first webinar on retail industry and the challenges uh, facing retailers and how to deal with those challenges. Um, I wanted to follow up on what Nicole just said. As some of you may know, the Maryland Business Rebooted Program is the brainchild of Professors Michelle Beto, Judy Faust, uh, and the executive director of our executive education program, Chris Thompson, who worked above and beyond their call of duty to put together this free webinar series aimed at helping uh, business in needs during the pandemic and I'm very honored to be a part of the program. So today, um, I'm going to cover two, uh, four topics in today's talk. We're going to start with the major trends in the retailing industry before the COVID pandemic. As you will see, some of the trends are being accelerated and uh, amplified by the COVID uh, pandemic. And that leads to how the pandemic has impacted the retail industry. And the third topic I want to touch upon is how retailers have rise above and responded to the COVID challenges, which would provide some good uh, practices for all of us to learn from. And finally, I want to zoom in on the implications for small and mid-sized retailers. But before I get on with the first topic, we would like to do a quick poll to have a little bit of better understanding of our audience. So Nicole, if you could launch the poll, um, so it contains two questions about our audience, as you will see in a moment. By the way, Nicole, once the poll results uh, came in, could you make a screenshot so that we would have uh, a record of the data? Thank you. So it looks like we have half of the participants here directly working in the retailing business and another half or so coming from other businesses. So welcome. Hopefully um, we are able to share some useful insights to all of you, regardless of your line of work. Um, it's also um, good to know that most of you came from the Maryland and Mid-Atlantic region, but of course, uh, welcome um, to everybody who is interested in participating. All right. Um, so the first topic I would like to talk about is some major trends in the retailing industry before the pandemic, um, which um, as consumers, we live in breathing those trends um, in our everyday lives. So I'd like to um, launch another poll just to gauge everybody's understanding of um, you know, some basic uh, trends or the lay of the land of the retail industry. I'm going to call it a retail trivia quiz. I emphasize the trivia nature. So if you happen to not know the answers to some of the questions, please don't feel discouraged. Okay. Um, Nicole, could you launch the second poll, please? All right, if you were at an exam, then time is up. I'm going to end this poll. All right, let's look at the answers together. 
Well, what is the largest retailer in the world in terms of total sales? Unfortunately, in this case, the majority is not right. Uh, it is Walmart. Um, I'm not surprised that uh, many people or the majority of people here answered Amazon. Amazon uh, indeed is the largest online retailer. And uh, what is interesting is, um, as some of you may know that most of Amazon's sales, about 70% of Amazon's sales actually come from its marketplace model and only 30% of the sales um, are generated by their retail model. So purely speaking as a retailer, Amazon sales is up there, but it's not in the number one, number two, or even number three spots yet. Okay, it is Walmart. Um, what is the second largest retailer in the world in terms of total sales? Of course, if you answered Walmart, um, not surprisingly, you would address it here uh, and Amazon and Walmart. But in terms of total sales, it is actually Costco, surprising or not. And obviously that also makes Costco the second largest retailer in the United States. Um, I'm really happy to see that a couple of you actually mentioned Carrefour. In fact, Carrefour hold this honor for a very long time until 2013, when it actually fell from um, you know, that um, position. The next question, what is the largest supermarket chain in the United States? Um, you're absolutely right, it's Kroger's. Okay, Kroger's operates over 2000 namesake supermarket chains um, in the country. It doesn't have a presence along the East Coast. It's primarily in the Midwestern uh, markets, but as a supermarket chain, indeed it is the largest in the United States. So what is the average net profit margin of supermarket retailers in the US? It is around 1.5% shocking or not. Uh, indeed, uh, the supermarket or the food retailing industry um, is so competitive, which keeps on driving down the profit margin. Um, so 1.5 um, is the national average um, as we speak now. And the next question might sound like a trick question. Which retailer has the highest annual sales of food products in the United States? How can it not be Kroger? In fact, it's not, it's Walmart, okay? Um, and I'm going to talk about, um, you know, the competition in the food retailing and the implications for small local retailers as well. Dollar General, which is the leading dollar store in this country, adds more stores every year than Walmart, it is true. Um, dollar General add, added about on average 500 stores per year in the few years leading up to the pandemic. What percentage of total retail sales is generated by internet retailing in the US, as specifically said in 2019, so right before the pandemic? This question always gets um, you know, a wide range of answers. The answer is it's around 11%, shocking or not. Most people um, overestimate the share of online retail um, as a contribution to the total retail sales. So, Despite the very impressive and rapid growth rate, the lion's share of retailing transactions still occurs in the brick and mortar world. Um, yet about 50% of retailing purchases are influenced by the internet in one way or the other, um, which again has direct implications on many uh, retail sectors, including small and local retail um, stores. So I'm going to share the results here. Once again, I emphasize the trivial nature of um, you know, this exercise. All right, so what are the major trends in the retailing industry before the pandemic? Um, one of the major trends is the ri rising popularity of discount retailers. Discount retailers of a variety of formats. Here, I'm going to use some of the industry uh, terminologies to describe those retailers, but I will also give several examples so that it is more clear to everybody what kind of retailers I'm talking about. Um, found several merchandising um, groups. 
And those that operate on the discount pricing format have become particularly powerful and popular. For example, Home Depot and the Lowe's in the home improvement sector, IKEA in the furniture sector, staples for office supplies. Dollar stores is another form of retail uh, stores that have uh, really gaining popularity and power. Uh, those stores are operating on a no frill operation, uh, having fairly small storefronts, uh, oftentimes located in second and third tier strip centers. Each store is usually manned by only two to three employees, yet um, they are playing a larger than life importance in the retailing industry. Why? Uh, despite the um, oversaturation and intense competition in many retail sectors, there is still underserved, uh, large and underserved demand amongst the vast um, low income population in this nation. And dollar stores really fill a gap, especially in uh, low income urban neighborhoods. Uh, because of their smaller uh, store format, they're much more nimble and able to establish presence and grow in low-income urban areas. In fact, if you ask Walmart who is keeping you awake at night, one of the store format they're going to talk about is dollar stores. Uh, dollar General in particular, the largest dollar store chain in this country, has been growing very um, aggressively before the pandemic. Um, and they have also expanded their merchandise into many other uh, merchandise categories that are operated by um, supermarket retailers and discount um, mass merchandisers. Dollar stores, uh, including grocery, uh, dollar stores even have their own store brands in um, some product categories. Another type of stores that have been gaining popularity is uh, warehouse club stores. Um, for example, Costco, Sam's Club, which is owned by Walmart and the BJ Warehouse. Um, in fact, uh, um, Costco, as we just uh, talked about, uh, has become the nation under the world's second largest retailer in terms of total annual sales. And much of their growth is propelled by their um, ever expanding section of uh, selling food and grocery. Um, another discount format that has becoming more popular is the so-called off-price retailers, for example, TJ Maxx, Marshalls, which is actually owned by TJ Maxx, um, Ross. Um, consumers in general are gravitating toward retailers that offer good quality merchandise at attractive price. And off-price retailers, as many of you know, operate on a very different procurement uh, model. So they acquire um, their merchandise on opportunities at deeply discounted wholesale prices, for example, by buying directly from factories or from other regular priced retailers. Um, they actually add a pretty hefty percentage margin, but because of their unique procurement process and extremely low wholesale prices, they're still able to offer cut rate, low retail prices that really speaks to their appeal and rising popularity. Okay. Another form of discount retailers that is becoming more popular and powerful is discount supermarkets, including some international players like Audi. Audi currently have a presence in the US primarily along the East Coast, but it announced a very aggressive expansion plans a couple of years ago. Uh, Audi publicly announced that it planned to add about 2000 stores nationwide in the next five years or so. Um, as some of you may know that Audi is a German based retailer. It is presumably the most powerful hard discounting retailer in the world stage. Uh, interestingly, a couple of years ago, another German discount uh, food retailer also entered the US. It's called Lidl. Okay, in fact, Lidl has a presence in the Maryland area. Before you move on, we did get a question from our audience regarding mm -hmm. the 
quiz that we just saw. Um, mm -hmm. So you spoke about how the internet accounts for 11% of sales. And so the question that we got is um, when a consumer purchases online and then picks up in the store physically, does it count as an internet purchase or is it an in-store purchase? I think they wanna know what exactly constitutes. Okay, that's a great question. Um, it is, of course, by the counting by the retailers. And in this case, I think the common practice currently is counting it uh, in the internet domain. Um, but I think the question actually alluded to a really interesting trend during the pandemic that is because of the huge surge in the demand for online shopping. A lot of retailers actually resorted to order online and store fulfillment and store pickup. Um, so uh, what, where it, uh, it's counted um, is perhaps a secondary issue as to how a retailer actually can aggressively and uh, proactively respond to the search in the online uh, demand for online shopping. Okay. Um, did, that, did I answer the question? Uh, I think so. Thank you. Okay, too. all right. But uh, do send follow up questions if you would like uh, any uh, more clarification. All right. Um, so, another interesting uh, and major trend in the retailing space is related to food retailing that I already talked about the intense competition in the food retailing sector. Um, in the good old days, uh, supermarkets were the primary outlet for American consumers to buy food and grocery. But in the last two decades or so, we're seeing the inroad of mass merchandisers, the Walmart and the Target type, and the club warehouse stores aggressively ramping up their food retailing business. Um, that's why Walmart, in fact, is the nation's largest food retailer, even though Walmart does not primarily operate on a supermarket format. In fact, um, so how did Walmart achieve that? It's primarily through the so-called supercenter format. Um, as some of you may know, supercenter um, is a retail format that combines a regular sized grocery store supermarket and a regular sized discount general merchandising store under one roof. It is the ultimate format for satisfying one-stop shopping needs. And Walmart, um, started experimenting with the supercenter format in the late 1980s and they really have very aggressively uh, scaled up their uh, supercenters uh, nationwide. In fact, the supercenter had become the major growth engine for Walmart in the last couple of decades. And Walmart became the nation's number one food retailer in year 2000, so it has been 20 years already. Uh, again, even though it is not really a supermarket chain. Um, and Costco is another major player uh, in the food retailing now. Um, so with the intense competition, it's not surprising that uh, the net profit margin in um, the food retailing sector keeps on going down. Um, so this intense competition essentially pushed food retailers to uh, take on one um, of two um, trends, which I call them the bipolar, uh, the bipolar trends. Uh, one direction that many retailers decided to embrace is to going more upmarket, more upscale. Um, there are some primary examples like Whole Foods, uh, Wegmans in this region. Um, another direction that some supermarket retailers decided to pursue is the no frill discount format. Um, so, with the strong competition, um, it might come as a surprise that the selling food remains one of the most recession-proof and also profitable retail business. Uh, we're going to debunk, debunk this puzzle next time in the second webinar where I'm going to focus on covering uh, retail performance measures and how to utilize data analytics to improve retail businesses. Um, but in a nutshell, selling food is profitable primarily because of its high turnover rates. In fact, that is a major um, motivation for general um, uh, mass merchandisers like Walmart Target to aggressively getting into food retailing business. Um, another interesting trend along the way is even though at some point selling grocery online was declared like the, um, the 
Bermuda Triangle of e-commerce because of the unique challenges. Um, in recent years, we're seeing major supermarket chains and food retailers ramping up their online grocery shopping, which also played up really well during the pandemic. Um, switching gear toward another retail sector in the apparel and the fashion sector, we have seen major upheavals um, in that has been brewing for a couple of decades. First of all, there has been the oversupply and intense competition in this retail sector. Um, in fact, um, there has been a survey showing that the average American does not need to buy any clothing products for six months and would not feel any difference. So indeed, for many consumers, buying clothes has become something that we want, but don't necessarily need. So this really speaks to um, you know, the fierce competition and a lot of challenges facing apparel retailers. And along the way, uh, there, has, there has, um, have also been generational shifts in terms of um, the appeal of traditional brands. Um, as we know that uh, baby boomers are uh, very brand conscious generations and my generation, Generation X is a bit more laid back, but we also are gravitating or drawn to big established brands. However, the younger generations um, are very different. Millennials and the Gen, Gen Z are, are gravitating toward niche brands that um, allow them to better align and express their individualities, and they're rebelling against their parents' large established traditional brands. Um, another major disruptive force that have played out in the apparel sector is the rising popularity of fast fashion retailers, which really up um, you know, um, disrupted the traditional product design merchandising um, planning process of many um, apparel retailers. Um, as you know, that fast fashion retailers is about all about being fast and frequent replenishment. Zara um, brags about being able to replenish their stores twice a week with new merchandise. So with the fast fashion model, new styles, new um, clothing uh, and new uh, apparel products are being introduced on a constant basis. We're having 104 seasons a year instead of the traditional uh, planning cycle by apparel retailers, which centered around the four seasons. Um, with that, um, many traditional brands are not able to compete with fast fashion brands, as well as niche brands. Some of them originated from the online space. Um, so can fast fashion be stopped? Uh, we're definitely seeing some headwinds against uh, the fast fashion uh, retail sector. In fact, uh, there has been heightened consumer awareness and the demand for sustainability and a fair labor practice. And many fast fashion retailers have been criticized for the environmental impact, the very negative environmental impact that their business has had, the waste it generates, as well as um, you know the um, the appalling labor practices that uh, some of them rely on in developing countries. So we are going to see um, this interesting trends occurring in the uh, fashion apparel uh, sector. Uh, which also uh, speaks a lot to if you were a small local uh, business uh, operating in the fashion apparel space. Those are um, you know, um, important trends to be aware of and to adjust your business accordingly. G, if I might interrupt you again with a question. Yes, please so go ahead. Yes, Neil asked a follow-up question. So he had asked previously about the link between the internet um, kind of online ordering and then uh, picking up in the store. Mm -hmm. And so here he's asking, um, he is a retail landlord and he's wondering if this trend is projected to continue and should landlords be more proactive about providing curbside pickup? So I think par parking spaces. Um, and then he's saying, my gut says yes, but I'm wondering if there's any academic studies around this. 
Okay, great questions. Uh, you are three steps ahead of me, and we're certainly going to talk about um, the impact on pandemics and also uh, in the implications for uh, um, you know real estate owners. So the, my quick answer to your question is yes. Um, the trend of shifting um, shopping online is a non-stoppable trend, and it certainly will continue. And along the way, many retailers uh, react to that by ramping up, um, you know, fulfillment in store and the pickup, uh, curbside pickup or store pickup. So if you are a landlord, a real estate operator, to um, you know, instead of fighting against the, the trend. Uh, to embrace the trend and to think about how to incorporate your own business in sync with those major trends that's happening in the retailing industry. Um, and again, uh, we're going to talk more about the impact of the pandemic and the implications for retailers and how they reacted. Um, so um, I would encourage you to um, uh, ask more questions and follow up questions throughout uh, this uh, webinar and anytime when you feel like, but we certainly will talk more about it uh, in the later part of the webinar. Uh, thanks again for the question and thanks for uh, to Nicole for facilitating this conversation. Okay, um, I'm going to speed up a little bit uh, about the, uh, you know, the first topic. So another trend that we're seeing is department stores um, are losing their appeal. In fact, this trend has been going on for about three decades. So on the assortment front, this um, department stores, as we know, are large stores that are organized into individual merchandising departments. Many of them serve as anchor stores in uh, regional shopping malls, in closed shopping malls. And because of their big format in general, it is um, more difficult for them to react to the changing consumer needs and the trends, especially compared to specialty retailers who are specializing in covering certain merchandising groups. Um, on the store, uh, on the price front, department stores, because of their higher uh, cost structures, it is hard for them to compete with discount retailers. And in terms of convenience, they're certainly losing out to online retailers. So those factors really contributed to this long-term declining trend of department stores collectively as a retail format. Um, Mid-tier department stores had particularly suffered, in fact, for quite a long time. Uh, stories we have heard about the struggles of JCPenney, Sears, uh, those are pretty um, exemplary of um, um, you know, the struggles of this retail format. Um, High-end department stores in the past did better in general, but uh, in, since the last Great uh, Depression uh, in 2008-2009, uh, we are seeing several high-end department store chains are also facing the music, um, including Neiman Marcus that declared bankruptcy last year, um, Saks Fifth Avenue and uh, Lord & Taylor had their troubles even for a longer time. Um, so the declining popularity of department stores certainly have contributed to the overall declining of shopping malls. So for more than two decades, shopping malls are losing customer traffic to big box retailers that are uh, usually located in outside shopping malls and in freestanding locations, and in more recent years to online stores. So because of that, their overall market share in the retail industry has also seen a steady declining. But um, so before the pandemic, um, there, it was estimated that uh, wrong, um, amongst the nation's large regional enclosed shopping malls, there were about 12, close to uh, 1,200 of them. It was estimated that about 20 to 25% of them may not be able to make it in the next five years. And again, this estimate was made before the pandemic. And as we know that the pandemic really has hit shopping malls very hard. Um, but I do want to emphasize that uh, 
many shopping malls were not just sitting there idle and see their uh, you know, customers um, leaving or uh, you know, sales declining. Many of them have invested seriously into revamping shopping malls and create unique and compelling reasons to draw back consumers. And this involves not only introducing more attractive retailers and ramping up the retail operations, but it very much is anchored around beefing up the experiential aspect of the physical space that they have. That's their advantage. Um, and as well as um, you know, introducing higher end dining and beefing up entertainment and the recreational aspect of shopping malls. Um, and finally, in terms of online retailing, this obviously has uh, been a very major significant trend in the retail industry. Uh, one thing that makes online retailing so dynamic, so fascinating is its um, you know, rapid growth rates. Um, by the way, does anybody know when did um, online retailing activities start? Uh, you may not remember an age uh, where we don't have online retailing, but there is always a starting point and the big bang point. Okay, um, online retailing activities started in 1995. That was the same year when World Wide Web was introduced, which is a, a user-friendly interface that really popularized the internet technology to the general public and allowed retailers to embrace this technology to reaching reaching out to the mass market, including using it as a sales channel to directly sell to consumers. Okay. Um, internet retailing has been growing at more than 10% um, annually for about 25 years. Yet again, um, in terms of the total size of it compared to the vast size of the total um, you know, retailing industry, it's still a fairly small share. So by the end of 2019, it was estimated that total um, retail e-commerce sales reached about $600 billion in the, US, uh, in the US, which represents about 11% of total US retail sales. Um, but the pandemic really has um, put a you know, step function increase in the, um, in the growth of internet uh, shopping. It was estimated that by the third quarter of last year, um, internet retail sales accounted for about close to 15% of total US retail sales. We're still waiting for the last quarter numbers to come out, which should be in the next few weeks. Um, and that number uh, would be even higher because holiday shopping tends to have a much higher percentage share coming from the online space, um, as one would expect. Um, an interesting phenomenon in, uh, related to online retailing is, um, in fact, today's online retailing space is dominated by multi-channel retailers, and this is propelled by two um, co-evolving trends, traditional retailers going online and online retailers going offline. In fact, technically, even Amazon is a multi-channel retailer now. It has purchased Whole Foods in 2017 and uh, certainly has been uh, increasing its offline presence. Okay. Um, another uh, really uh, interesting trend related to online retailing is the growing power of e-commerce marketplaces. In the early years of online retailing or retail e-commerce activities in this country, most um, retailers, large retailers, set up their own shops or worked with web service providers to set up um, um, their shops. Um, but we're seeing this rising power of e-commerce marketplaces, um, including Amazon places, uh, eBay, and some other uh, examples like Etsy, Wayfair, even uh, Walmart in recent years are aggressively ramping up their marketplace model. So in the e-commerce marketplace, the marketplace operator offers essentially this place where third party sellers can set up shop and to utilize the support that the marketplace uh, operators provide. Um, um, as I mentioned, um, while uh, Amazon is the largest uh, um, e-commerce operator in this country, but about 
30% of the sales come from Amazon's own retail businesses. The other 70% actually came from the marketplace model where they provide this place, host the third party sellers, and then uh, take commission from those transactions. Um, another important trend related to e-commerce activities is the integration of social media and e-commerce. So many retailers uh, and uh, brand companies have invested in the brand, their brand social profiles and to using social media forums websites to draw in traffic to their uh, retail sites as well as offline uh, retail stores. And along with that, um, you know, we are seeing this phenomenon of increasing um, impact of influencers, including many micro influencers. Um, and some of the social media platforms are playing a more important role in e-commerce activities, for example, uh, Shopify, Instagram, and so on and so forth. And I think the last two trends that I mentioned here, the growing power of e-commerce marketplace, as well as the integration of social media and e-commerce um, have particular importance, uh, importance to small and local retailers who are looking for ways to move their business online or ramp up their online presence. Um, so now let's switch our gear to um, the second topic, the impact of the pandemic on the retail industry. Um, as you say that uh, some of the major trends that had been going on in the retail industry for a long time have been accelerated or amplified by the pandemic, yet the pandemic also imposes unique and new challenges to retailers big and small. In terms of supply chain, we're seeing major disruptions to global supply chain networks, which certainly has disrupted the uh, business of many retailers. And um, retailers also face the challenge of how to keep their workforce safe and healthy during the pandemic. And as many retailers have found out that it is really not easy to quickly ramp up manufacturing and distribution capabilities for a lot of products, as we saw in the earlier um, you know, uh, months of the pandemic. Um, personal protective um, equipment, sanitization products, even paper products flying off shelves and the retailers struggle with filling up um, their um, inventory, their shelves, and the manufacturers, um, you know, face the struggle of how to ramp up their production and their, you know, they just couldn't let their machine uh, run fast enough. Um, and along the way, with the surging demand of online shopping, many retailers struggled with how to meet the surging demand for uh, home deliveries. And uh, we're going to talk about, um, you know, some of the actions that they take in response to those challenges. And on the demand side, we're certainly seeing big shift of consumer spending patterns. Okay, I'm going to pause a moment and ask the audience to share your input. So can you speak based on your personal experience? How have you or your household spending patterns or purchase behaviors changed during the pandemic? Um, I would appreciate if you could type up a brief answer in the chat and then Nicole will summarize it for us. Thank you. So please share with us how your or your family, your household's purchase behaviors, uh, spending patterns have changed during the pandemic. Very interesting. So Nicole, perhaps you could go over the answers here um, with all participants. Um, you could also summarize some of the answers if they share similar nature. Thank you, Nicole. Sure, um, uh, I could just maybe read a little bit of what I'm, what I'm seeing here. Um, so Michael, uh, the first one to share uh, your answer. So thank you, Michael. Michael said, um, Mostly, he's been spending on eating out and not traveling, or not, <laughs> not traveling. Um, and otherwise, the purchase patterns have not really changed. Interesting. But other people are saying that their purchase patterns have changed, it seems. So Judy said, we're spending much less on clothing um, and far less on eating out. So similar to Michael. 
And then Harry said, um, I save more cash, put it into the savings <laughs> account and cut back unnecessary expenses. And this seems to be a trend. Interestingly, a lot of people said cut uh, down on impulse purchases, unnecessary expenses. Um, and then Neil said spent less in restaurants, theaters, and entertainment venues. Interesting. And then spent more online and for delivery. Um, I'm assuming that's for food. Uh, spent money on, on home fitness equipments. I have as well. Uh, Judy said, I've tried to buy from local stores. Interesting, um, for example, bookstores to help them stay alive. That's a really interesting um, change that I'm, I think we're all seeing. Uh, and then Harry said, less impulsive spending again. So this seems to be a trend we're seeing. Jeff said, little to no in-person retail shopping other than grocery. Uh, significantly increased online purchasing as well. Um, okay, so, so just most, mostly food has significantly increased, but other things have decreased. Andrew said, I was amazed that my kids started furnishing his room through delivery as opposed to brick and mortar. Mm -hmm. As a Gen Z, would not have conceived of that. Um, I saw a bookshelf <laughs> show up <laughs> on restaurants, but um, order in has definitely increased. So a lot of people have been purchasing food and getting it delivered. Uh, so less impulsive purchases, less on clothing, similar to what, G, what you were saying, uh, more in grocery stores. And then um, I go to the supermarket less often and purchase more each time to cut down on the chances of visiting stores. Interesting. Uh, and then Chris says, uh, wonder if single visit sales are up. So that was a question, um, but very, very interesting responses. It seems it's uh, less impulse purchases and mostly spent on food and grocery shopping and kind of more ordering food. Yes, indeed. And this is really very much in line with the nationwide trends that we're seeing. Um, I'm curious, um, one, um, one thing that people did not mention, but doesn't mean that they did not do, is investing in home improvement. Just out of curiosity, how many of you uh, or your uh, family have done at least one home improvement project? And you could just, uh, you know, put in I or something, because um, uh, I wish we um, have a regular format so we can actually see people raising their hands. Yeah. I forgot to mention, I just saw that Larry also posted in the Q&A um, mm -hmm. an answer. So both myself and my wife certainly do not go out nearly as much as we used to, um, to shopping malls. Uh, so nor do we eat out anywhere near as often. So shopping malls and eating out have definitely decreased. Yeah. yeah. A lot of us have done that, right? Um, aha, interesting. We did, yes, lots of paints. Um, yes home improvement um, projects. Um, speaking of personal experience, we also joined the about 75% of American households um, who did at least one home improvement projects last year um, during the pandemic. Yes, we're locked up at home. We have this time on hand. We're stressed out, we are anxious, and we really want to do something productive and positive and where else to start than our own house. Okay, very interesting. Um, thanks again for sharing and thanks to Nicole for summarizing the answers. Um, so Wall Street Journal ran a really interesting article by the end of last year, summarizing some interesting shifting patterns, in, uh, shifting consumer spending patterns uh, organized by categories. They did their analysis based on credit card data from the research company Ernest Research. Okay, so I thought those graphs actually speak a thousand words. Um, so I'm just going to, uh, you know, go over these graphs um, with the audience here and to highlight some of the trends, which uh, really there's no big surprises. It's very much consistent with the personal experience you just shared with us. Um, so. Here, in terms of the overall spending patterns by different uh, retail um, outlets, uh, we're seeing overall um, a 9%. So all the numbers are changed in spending compared to a year earlier, okay? Overall um, spending on home improvement um, you know, outlets, 9% increase. Grocery on the net is flat 1%, but you're going to see, you know, the shopping venues certainly have shifted a lot. 
Um, I'm actually a little surprised by this restaurant overall, only negative 1%. My personal feeling is it should, uh, the decrease should be much larger. Uh, apparel and the accessory, uh, a drop of 21%. Department stores, a drop of 30%. Travel and the transportation, a drop of 54%. Events and attractions, a whopping 72% uh, decline. Again, very much um, consistent with um, the experience that people just shared. And in terms of dining, we're seeing a drop across the board of on-site din dining from quick service restaurants, fast casual restaurants to casual dining restaurants. And of course, now surprisingly fine dining restaurants were hit the hardest um, in their overall spending dropped by about 46%. In contrast, delivery, and this is just a, you know spending based on credit card spending from delivery aggregators went up by 116%. And look at, at the peak time, a whopping 172% of increase. That really you know, tells us something about you know, how people are spending on food uh, and dining. And related to that, in terms of grocery shopping, grocery shopping, as we saw in the first graph, the overall spending has been flat. However, big discrepancies in terms of how consumers have shifted their shopping venues Online grocery spending has gone up by 73% compared to a year ago. Meal kits, whole meal kit delivery went up by 55%. And in contrast, um, in-store supermarket sales have dropped by 7% and the specialty grocery stores, the Whole Foods type, um, have, uh, came, um, have come down by um, about 16%. During the peak of the pandemic, uh, in terms of the online grocery shopping, it shot up to about 210% of the increase. So this all has implications if you operate in the grocery food retailing business or restaurant business. Um, Nicole, is there a question coming in? I saw a signal online, please go ahead. Yes, um, so I was actually gonna ask. Uh, mm -hmm. The question was asked by Scott and he was mm -hmm. basically of echoing your question about the first graph that you shared. So after mm -hmm. the pandemic, it, it seemed that restaurants um, only sing, uh, suffered from a 1% loss. Um, and so he was asking if that's true. So it's, if it's only negative 1%, why are so many going under? And we also got a uh, one kind of potential answer that Harry was raising. Uh, he was mm -hmm. saying maybe it's because people have spent their stimulus checks um, and maybe when it runs out, um, this will become a little bit worse. Um, and so if you have any kind of insight to speak on that, that'd be great. Right. Those are uh, great questions. Personally, I'm also doubtful about that number, only negative 1%. Um, I'm, I, I can't speak to why um, that's what, uh, you know, that particular source of data indicates. Personally, I think the uh, spend, restaurant spending overall, the drop uh, should be much more severe. Um, so in terms of clothing, just like everybody said, cutting back on clothing, um, spending myself included, but I thought what is also interesting is the shifting spending patterns in terms of different types of clothing or clothing categories. So it's not all declining. In fact, uh, um, the uh, spending on active wear and athleisure, so more comfy um, uh, closing for, you know, at uh, working from home, learning from home, in fact, have uh, gone up at its peak time, even, you know, in, uh, at one point, we saw a, almost 70% increase, uh, and year around, it's close to 9% increase. Jewelry and watches increasing, uh, interestingly, actually saw a small increase. I would attribute this to perhaps the Zoom effect. Now people have to present themselves on screen all the time. And uh, so um, jewelry and watches may, you know, help that. Um, it's just a uh, guess. Um, but certainly uh, what cannot be ignored is the very significant drop in spending footwear and professional and dressy attire. Um, if you are operating in the clothing apparel um, sector, uh, this is certainly trends that you need to follow very closely and uh, pivot 
uh, your assortment, your designs to, um, you know, uh, to uh, the changing lifestyle and the dressing style of American consumers. Um, in terms of self-care, um, not surprisingly, spending on spas, salons, and um, have come down, and even oral care products, uh, oral care spending have come down, and many salons and spas were among the first to be closed and kept closed for the longest time because of the uh, COVID um, control measures. Um, what is interesting is makeup and skin products actually saw a moderate increase. Again, I would attribute this to the Zoom effect and just uh, feeling good effect, the so-called lipstick effect during recessions. Um, Nicole, um, were there questions and comments coming in? Uh, no, it was just a question about um, whether the webinar will be available um, later, and it definitely will be, Andrew. It'll be online, this is recorded, and so you'll be able to view the whole webinar um, later on online as well. Okay, thanks for the clarification, Nicole. Um, and home improvement, <laughs> the fun projects that many of us have uh, worked on or been getting ourselves involved. Um, overall, certainly we have seen significant increase in spendings at home improvement um, retailers, as well as gardening uh, centers, home furnishing um, stores. Uh, those also has, again, implications for small local businesses, depending on which uh, uh, line of business that you operate in, what type of merchandise you are uh, specializing in. In terms of home entertainment, now surprisingly, consumers have significantly increased their spending on home entertainment products in general, especially in terms of video streaming, in terms of music, uh, sorry, video streaming and music streaming uh, game that um, also has seen a big increase. Um, unfortunately, bookstore uh, saw their sales declining and I was really touched by some of you saying um, you particularly wanted to uh, buy books and to you know help uh, bookstores. Um, so all of those forces really led to a bipolarization in terms of impact of the pandemic on the retail industry. On one hand, some retailers are uh, really going through what is called the retail apocalypse. We're seeing um, you know large number of shopping malls being closed and some of them may remain closed for good an unprecedented number of retailers filing for bankruptcy, many of them coming from the department store and apparel store sectors. And the small local retailers are hit particularly hard. While large uh, national chain store retailers, when they file for bankruptcy, most of them file for chapter 11 protection, uh, which gives them some room to opportunities to renegotiate the debt obligations to restructure and hopefully being able to re-emerge out of the bankruptcy. But that cannot be said um, about many small local retailers. Um, many of them, when they close their business, it's permanent. Um, yet there are also big winners emerging out of the, um, um, the pandemic. Um, as we know that with the huge uh, surge in uh, demand in online retailing, so in general retailers that already had a strong e-commerce capabilities or are able to quickly ramp up their e-commerce capabilities have tremendously benefited from the changing consumer uh, you know, shopping patterns. Home improvement stores, not surprisingly, 75% of American households are, you know, doing home improvement projects. Um, so that certainly is um, you know, something that benefited those retailers. Electronic uh, retailers in general um, have also saw increasing spending uh, with their business. It's because consumers are um, um patterns in terms of how people buy food and spend on uh, meal products and food products. Home meal kit delivery services certainly have seen a, a revised surge. And along the way, home delivery services like uh, um, uh, Grubhub, um, Instacart, uh, Uber Eats, they're not retailers per se, but they're certainly riding high with the 
surging demand for online shopping. So the next topic I want to transition to is how retailers have responded to the challenges during the COVID pandemic. Um, I want to again pose a question to the audience to the extent that uh, you would like to share with us, um, especially if you are uh, working in the retail business or have family friends involved in retail business, or if you're not uh, in the retail business, you can speak to your observations of um, you know, um, retailers. So how has your retail business adapted to the challenges during the pandemic? Or if you're not in retailing business, what do you think retailers have been doing to adapt, to pivot, to, uh, you know, in response to those challenges? So please type your answer in the chat. Um, and Nicole is going to summarize it for us. And we appreciate you sharing uh, your experience and, and your insights. All right, so Nicole, perhaps you could um, help summarize uh, some of the answers that we have received so far. Sure. Um, so Judy, I think, was um, sharing with us her observations uh, of seeing more kind of ordering online options and curbside pickup options that are being offered. Um, so maybe uh, retailers are kind of expanding how their uh, takeout services are being offered. And then Michael was also sharing that um, he revamped their uh, online sales platform to make it more user friendly and significantly increased home deliveries, which is um, something interesting. Uh, Judy was also saying that Apple had a pretty sophisticated appointment system during the holidays for in-store visits. Uh, and then Harry just typed in, retailers have switched to more digital sales. Yes, so more mm -hmm. kind of online uh, shopping. Yes, those are great practices and great observations. Um, so let me share with you um, some observations I have had by gleaning the, um, the media uh, coverage about how retailers have responded to the COVID challenges. Um, most of this is based on how large, uh, you know, national, multinational retailers have shared with the, the media, okay? But I do think they offer, uh, those good practices offer uh, great insights for all of us le to learn from and also have direct implications for small local retailers. First and foremost, it goes without saying to implement safety measures for employees and customers, right? And uh, another common practice is to ramping up e-commerce capabilities. And specifically, this involves improving the technology and the supply chain infrastructure and uh, shifting store-based employees to the online divisions, for example, in call centers, fulfillment centers, and the delivery crews. And um, another common practice is to utilizing stores as fulfillment centers for online orders. Um, in fact, this has been the primary fulfillment model that some uh, retailers, for example, Target and Walmart have been using for their e-commerce uh, retail business even before the pandemic. And it makes sense, um, you know, uh, especially during the pandemic and along the way to encourage order online and the store or curbside pickup to ease the, uh, what they call the flattening the shipping curve. Another common practice that have been embraced by many retailers is to simplify assortments, uh, to eliminate slow moving fringe products and to give priorities to those high demand uh, products, uh, you know, uh, stock keeping units to simplify the supply chain and to improve efficiency, okay? Along the way to modify the supply chain uh, process for example, by bypassing distribution centers and shipping directly to stores, um, you know, and to shortening the supply chain. As many retailers have experienced the major disruptions of their supply chain process, especially those who tend to source a major, uh, you know, a, a large portion of their merchandise from overseas markets, the uh, you know disruption of the pandemic certainly is global and the tightened safety measures, inspection measures imposed by many um, governments, local or national, um, have 
significantly slow down the supply chain process as well. So with that, many retailers are re-examining their supply chain process, including restructuring the supply chain network to reduce the apply, uh, the, their reliance on international suppliers and the switching to source locally or from domestic suppliers. So being local, that's the key word, um, you know, during the pandemic. Um, and so with that, I want to transition to the last topic, which is just a starting point in terms of, uh, you know, ideas, insights, strategies that uh, uh, we hope to disseminate to help, especially small and mid-sized uh, retailers. Um, so um, first of all, you need to think about to modify and enhance store operations that um, obviously include um, implementing and uh, ramping up safety measures, um, not only sanitization procedures, but the crowd uh, control. Um, to invest in contactless, uh, contactless payments, um, to ration high demand items, if you are fortunate enough to be in the business where your uh, products constantly sell out to your shelves running um, you know, empty, certainly um, you know, to ration it, manage it so that you can serve as many customers um, as possible. And uh, along the way, how do you deal with unruly customers, customers who flout uh, COVID safety measures um, so those are challenges, in fact, facing big or small retailers, as, um, you know, um, alluding to one of the topics that we're going to offer uh, in the third webinar, uh, which is going to be a forum form format. We have lined up three uh, experts from, uh, you know, uh, to talk about different topics. And one of the topics that will be offered by somebody from the National Retail Federation Foundation is a de-escalation training that uh, the National Retail Federation is putting out uh, to help educate, to assist the retailers um, in this aspect. Um, Nicole, um, yes, please go ahead. Yes, yes. Um, so there was a question that we got from Harry mm -hmm. and he's wondering about, um, so the question is, uh, is relying on domestic manufacturers making products more expensive? since the product costs of these manufacturers will be passed on to consumers? Right, um, that's a great question. And it's a tricky balance that many uh, retailers have struggled with, right? So uh, sourcing from domestic manufacturers, certainly the direct uh, cost of merchandise would be higher and sometimes substantially higher. Nonetheless, um, you know, it comes with multiple hidden benefits that's not directly reflected in the cost of merchandise. Shorter supply chain reduces uncertainty and a shorter turnover cycle would also means that you don't have to order and stock up um, the same amount of inventory as you would do with long distance overseas sourcing. And also, as we know that there is a push and heightened awareness uh, from the consumer side in terms of buying local supporting, um, you know, American companies, American manufacturers, as well as local businesses. So in fact, some retailers have been successful in riding on that consumer sentiment, consumer demand. So again, I hear uh, your concern and that's it's a very, um, you know, relevant concern, and it's about making the balance. Um, was there another question, Nicole? No, that's it. Thank you, G. Okay, thank you, Nicole, and uh, thank you, Harold, for the question. Um, and it goes without saying, we, uh, you know, small and mid-sized retailers uh, in general tend to be falling behind in e-commerce capabilities if it happens to be the case uh, for you, then ramping up e-commerce capabilities is certainly in, uh, you know, imperative during the pandemic. And in fact, not only during the pandemic, but going much beyond the pandemic, just because as I said, this uh, shifting, um, you know, the surging demand and shifting up to online shopping is a non-stoppable trend. And it's likely to stay there even after the pandemic is fully under control, even when the economy is back to normal, people is back to 
their normal um, you know, shopping routines or business. So with that, obviously, um, in, if you have very little presence online before the pandemic, the big question is how do you move your business or part of your business online? And along the way, how do you build up delivery capacities? So um, in the third webinar that we're going to offer uh, under the retailing topic, we have invited an expert from a consulting company who has many years of field experience advising sellers um, on uh, large e-commerce platforms. So uh, James Thompson, his name's James Thompson, he is going to offer some great insights and practical advices on um, how to move your business online and how to utilize large um, e-commerce um, marketplaces like Amazon. And along the way, how do you build up your delivery capacities? Should you use third-party delivery companies like Uber Eats, uh, Grubhub, uh, Instacart, or should you uh, use your, um, your in-house team? Um, and that certainly is uh, also a, you know, a deliberation about the cost and benefits. Um, another aspect of that is small and mid-sized retailers um, should pay attention to and learn from the more successful stories um, if you're struggling uh, with your business is to take a careful re-examination of your assortment to streamline the assortment so that you can enhance the operational efficiency that boils down to very operational details such as what product categories, what brands what, or what stock keeping units to eliminate and what scale up. And this obviously needs to be done based on very solid and a careful um, analysis. So in the second uh, webinar that I'm going to offer, I will focus on utilizing uh, data analytics to enhance retail business, including many of those operational details and uh, how to use um, data that are readily available from your existing inventory and bookkeeping um, you know, systems to assist a variety of um, decisions, including assortment decisions is a part uh, of the coverage. Um, and uh, along the way, um, I want to emphasize the need to strengthen ties to the local community and deepen the personal connections with customers we now live in the physically distanced world, yet the social connection is ever more um, and has never been more important in our personal lives and in businesses. And I also want to um, um, emphasize that many people um, you know, really want to step up to help their local business, uh, including their beloved local retailers to stay in business. Um, many people made a concerted effort, as I've seen in one of the comments, that I tend to spend more to my uh, to small business, local business, because I want to help them stay alive. So um, consumers during the pandemics are, in fact, more responsive to the appeals to the um, you know uh, to the appeals to help support local business, and I think they are also going to be more appreciative to those local businesses that have reached out and show how they care about their community, their customers' needs and changing trends, how they have pivoted their businesses to, uh, you know, um, uh, to support consumers. And they're, uh, so on the, uh, the flip side, um, you know, people in the community are also likely to be more responsive to willing to step up to help local business. And finally, I want to bring up the topic of location decisions and the need to re-evaluate location decisions for uh, retailers, especially small local retailers that happen to be located in shopping malls. Um, as we talked about earlier, uh, shopping malls really have been hit very hard. Consumers are um, still very concerned about going to in, um, large enclosed crowded spaces and that's exactly what shopping malls are um, and that consumer sentiment is likely to linger on for a long time so i don't think food traffic into shopping malls will rebound um, anytime soon so if you happen to be located in a shopping mall what do you uh, what how should you react to that 
uh, certainly, um, you know, one option is to think about is there room to renegotiate your leasing agreement with the landlord, with the shopping mall operators, or um, can you sublease it to somebody else? And um, some retailers in the need to ramping up their e-commerce capabilities are actually looking for vacant spaces which, um, you know, that they can utilize to convert into mini fulfillment centers, mini distribution centers. So would you be better off by subleasing your uh, spaces in shopping malls that way and looking for better location opportunities when we know that vacancy rates are at all time high in a variety of uh, real estate um, uh, venues and opportunities. So again, the question that you know, I don't have um, answers, good answers to that, but I do want to raise that question to your attention. This obviously also has implications if you're on the other side of the coin. If you're a, you know, a real estate uh, operator, then you know, what's the implication for you? So there are multiple uh, options to at least to consider. So with that, I would like to close my um, presentation and um, Perhaps, Nicole, before we open up for further questions and answers, I could uh, very quickly preview a couple of upcoming webinars. Um, so as um, Nicole and I mentioned earlier, today's webinar is the first of a three-part series focusing on the retailing industry and how to deal with challenges in the retail industry during the pandemic and especially uh, insights and ideas that we could offer to help small local uh, retail businesses. So the second webinar, which is going to take place two weeks from today, um, will focus on the analytics side of the retail business. So I'm going to uh, talk about some basic and really um, important performance measures and how to utilize data analytics to uh, perform better diagnostic analysis and help retailers improve their businesses. And the third one will take on the forum format. Uh, we have lined up um, you know, three great panelists. James Thompson from the consulting company Buybox Experts will share his insights and field experience on how um, for a small business to move their um, um, some of their business online or how to compete and how to successfully compete in that space. And we also have two speakers from the National Retail uh, Federation Foundation uh, talking about um, you know, share insights on how retailers can uh, enhance and improve their store operations, uh, including uh, the de-escalation training that they're offering to retailers nationwide. So uh, with that, I'm going to transition to Nicole to also give a shout out to uh, an another panel discussion with uh, restaurant owners as a part of the Maryland Business Rebooted Program. Nicole, off to you. Thank you, Ji. Um, before I give the introduction for our next webinar, um, I do want to address uh, one question that we received from our audience. So mm -hmm. Harry was actually asking a follow-up question of, um, I think he's curious about why Americans might not be interested in going to shopping malls anymore. So the physical, um, the physical shopping okay. malls. I wouldn't say Americans are not interested in shopping malls anymore, but the pandemic certainly has imposed an unprecedented challenges to shopping malls. Um, and one uh, major reason obviously is out of safety and health concerns. Shopping malls, as we know, are large packed enclosed um, space, especially uh, I'm talking about enclosed shopping malls. And that's the last place that many people feel comfortable returning to. So this um, you know, uh, concern for safety and health and this um, consumer sentiment is likely to linger on for some time. However, on the opposite side, um, there's also a pent up demand for social interaction. After all, shopping is not um, just about changing money and the goods. Um, in fact, uh, you know, shopping in a variety of categories, um, apparel, jewelry, um, you know, games, um, entertainment products, is very much about the experience, about the fun of it. And many consumers actually enjoying, um, you know, 
the social aspects of shopping in those categories, going out with your friends, with your family, and the shopping malls can provide a really enticing physical space. As I said, not only as a shopping venue, but as a destination for fine dining, for entertainment and recreation. And that's what shopping malls are relying on to revitalize, to, um, you know, to counter this long-term declining trend even before the pandemic. So I'm optimistic that many of them will weather the storm and will be able to emerge strong, but it may take a while. Yes, thank you, G and Harry. Hope that answered your question. Um, so let me go back um, to this last slide. So thank you again, G, um, for your very, very wonderful first lecture on the uh, in this three-part series. And as you already previewed, um, this first session, I think really helped us better understand the overall landscape of retailing in the face of COVID. And I think I speak for everyone when I say that I'm very much looking forward to the next two webinars from G. And <laughs> in addition to G's next two lectures on retailing, we also have a really exciting panel discussion planned on February 17th, also at 3 p.m. So we've invited a panel of five very successful local restaurant owners, from a really different variety of backgrounds and they all, they're they all in very different tiers of restaurants. So it'll be very interesting to see how they discuss how they've been able to pivot and adapt in, in, this, uh, in this COVID environment. And so we invite you to join us uh, in this very exciting panel discussion on February 17th. And finally, just to reiterate, today's webinar is recorded and it is available for everyone to watch again on our Maryland Re Rebooted website. Um, and today's webinar should be uploaded in a few days. And as for those of you that are interested in learning a little bit more about specific topics of either retailing or different business aspects, please also check out Maryland's Micro Masters program series, which offer longer and more in-depth sessions on these different topics. So thank you again to G and our audience today. And I don't think we have any more questions at this point. And so um, we'll end our session here, uh, here today. So we hope to see you again in our next webinar and thank you everybody for joining today. Thank you very much, Nico, and thank you very much for participating and for joining us. Thank you, G.